It is neither good morning, it is neither good afternoon. 12 p.m. on the spot. Ladies and gentlemen, day three, day three of the Zero Project Conference 2023. Thank you for everyone who's with us here at the United Nations office at Vienna. And thank you to the countless online participants joining us, what will arguably be one of the most vivid and colorful conversations um, of this year's Zero Project Conference 2023. I can give away, there will be many things which you will see today. There will be colorful birds. It will make all sense for now they're flying around the room, but we will add and give you context specifically in our session called Inclusive Street Art. I will also be showing some props later on so you will be really able to visualize the good practice we're talking about here. It is my also distinct pleasure to ask someone who's been involved for decades in the promotion of the arts, especially of the arts for all, inclusive and accessible for all, none other than our founder and chairman of the board, Martin Essel, would like to say a few opening words before we plunge into a fantastic conversation with participants from Serbia and the United States of America. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robin. Uh, dear uh, ladies and gentlemen and dear friends, uh, I'm very thrilled to be with you today uh, for a very important uh, topic, and that is arts for all. Arts for all. The musician um, uh, shows that it is very important to open the houses, the musician houses, for all, and now, we are talking about uh, drawings and arts, and in many cases, so few uh, people with disabilities joins the museums. And we have to do something against this. But on the other hand, we were inspired <coughs> very recently with graffiti, street arts. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, tell you a story, uh, how it works. Uh, Robin uh, had a holiday last year, I think it was in spring, or uh, uh, early summer, in uh, Belgrade, in Serbia. And he came uh, back to me and uh, was very thrilled and uh, showed me photos of um, graffiti arts and uh, he showed me that they are including uh, tactile plates where all persons with and without disabilities can touch and feel and can be involved in this new type of, um, uh, of uh, uh, type of uh, inclusive, uh, to, to make uh, art inclusive. And that was so fascinating. Uh, that uh, I asked um, Robin to take this uh, uh, small project over and he has full support uh, through me and um, what we did was to uh, ask uh, our Serbian friends uh, to um, bring us in contact with the Graffiti uh, Society in Vienna and we found out that uh, there are a lot of uh, graffitis, but no one is inclusive. And therefore, Robin and I decided to change that. Uh, what's better to ask professionals? We uh, informed the uh, society, uh, the, the Austrian uh, community, graffiti community, with Kale Libre and uh, Mr. Kanter, is now uh, approaching us to be part of the session here. Uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, we uh, asked um, him to give us um, graffitis and show us graffitis we can make uh, accessible. And uh, the, the result of this was that we asked the Serbian friends to make uh, tactile patterns uh, for a uh, special um, location. This is on the 7th district of Vienna on Karl Farkasplatz near uh, Burggasse. 
where uh, the Cali Libre Festival, an annual graffiti festival, um, uh, opened up by Mr. Kantner, uh, had uh, drawn <coughs> three graffitis in one area, and we asked the Serbian friends to make uh, tactile plates out, out of it, and additionally, uh, also uh, in writing, so that people who can write uh, and, and read uh, will uh, find information about these graffitis, and those who wants to touch uh, whether uh, those people have uh, sight disabilities or not, it doesn't matter, just to be much more involved in arts. And we found out, thank you so much um, uh, for that, and you will have the possibility also to touch and feel. Uh, and what's important in inclusive arts is that uh, our creator offered us five senses. And the more senses you integrate in arts, the better you memorize art. Uh, the best way is, or if you get in contact with a girl, as a man, for example, uh, then uh, smelling is also uh, uh, relevant, you know? Seeing, smelling, hearing, and the more senses you integrate in arts, the more uh, you, you keep this artwork in your mind and you are enriched in life. And this is the reason why these tactile plates are not here just for uh, uh, persons who are really blind, but for all of us. And it should offer us the possibility to uh, to, to um, deep down in the, in the water of, 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 of beautiful arts. And this is what we are doing. And therefore, after we have decided this, uh, we asked um, the Serbian friends uh, to make a deal. And this was to find a uh, graffiti artist from Serbia uh, to uh, make us a proposals about a very important topic Zero Project is all about, and this is uh, inclusion. And ja Jana, uh, the lady uh, with the um, uh, um, light hair, uh, not next to me, but uh, uh, next to, to Robin, uh, she's from Serbia, and she's a beautiful artist. And she accepted to come to the Global Zero Project Conference, and I tell you, it's the first paint produced during a conference in the United States since its founding uh, of uh, the United Nations. Isn't that amazing? And it's not just the arts, but it's an inclusive artwork. Thank you so much, Jana, for this, uh, for this approach. And uh, now I have to stop. Uh, and to give uh, the uh, stage to the real professionals. Thank you so much. Thank you for those words, Martin. Uh, we appreciate uh, the time, energy, and resources you've committed uh, to this great endeavor. Street art, graffiti, comes from the word, the Italian word, graffio, which means to scratch. So what we're gonna do in this session, we're gonna scratch deep into what street art means, a bit of its history, and then outline good practices, which Martin has alluded to. You've, and you've seen the boards, and we'll get into detail how these have come together, the role which persons with disabilities have played at the inception and conception of these projects, and to really highlight that this can be done anywhere. It doesn't have to be Belgrade, it can be Oakland, it can be Tel Aviv, it can be Melbourne, it can be Kinshasa, it can be any city, village, or town in the world which has a mural, which has a graffiti, or any type of art of street art. But as Martin said, neither he or I are experts, so let's hand it over to those who really are. And therefore, it's my distinguished pleasure to welcome our first speaker for today, which is Liliana Radosevic, the art historian and curator 
of Street Art Belgrade, the wonderful partner which has made this all happen. Liliana, the floor is yours. And if we could get Liliana's PowerPoint as well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Robin, and thank you all for being here. We are super happy to share this project with you because we love it so much. Um, as uh, Robin said, um, we are Street Art Belgrade, so we can move to the next slide. And uh, our most important um, <coughs> role, um, I think my green I press, but <laughs> nothing works. Ah, right, that one. Okay, so, uh, yes, so Street Art Belgrade. Uh, we are a group of people that have been dedicated to research, documentation, and promotion of graffiti and street art for more than 20 years. And since we already mentioned graffiti and street art, uh, our host today asked me to tell you something about it so that we can be you know, on the same page about what we uh, talk about. So when we say graffiti, this is really a huge umbrella term that has so many different things within it. But when we talk about graffiti, we actually talk about graffiti culture that originated in New York in the 1970s. And from graffiti culture, we have something that, was, uh, th that is a new visual expression that we call street art. The mutual thing is that this is the public uh, art done in public space, and it's done without permission. So this is a very important element. Uh, but what we see most of the time in the big cities today is actually new muralism. So this is pretty much the same thing done only with the permission. So as you can see, this is quite a complex topic and uh, it would take really, really long time to discuss about it. But just when you think about it, think about the issues like what do you think public space is? What are permissions? What are techniques used? Uh, what are the topics that they're using? the motivation of the artist and so on and so forth. So I, I think like now you can do a bit of your own research and discover this amazing world behind it. But we are here to talk about our project that is actually called Art in the Passage. And it started in 2021, but in actuality we started working on it in 2019 when uh, we finished our virtual reality exhibition and we realized that there was a, a big group that was excluded. So people that are blind and partially sighted, they really don't see what's out there on the streets. Therefore, they can't really participate in anything that we do. And our friend and colleague Yelena suggested that we should actually do 3D prints uh, to present these murals that we can find in the streets. And uh, it took us years and years <laughs> to actually get our first funding. Uh, and thanks to Yelena, who was very, uh, very determined to get somewhere with this project, we actually got it finally. And now we have nine models uh, in Belgrade. And we have three models here in, in Vienna. And uh, we are lucky that uh, in this year, 2023, our friend and colleague Yana uh, actually made the first mural with 3D elements in it. So what you can see now on the screen are two murals uh, that are in Belgrade, done by artist Vijor. And we thought that the elements from which uh, this uh, head of a wolf and head of a giraffe were constructed were actually perfect in order to make 3D models. And uh, then we started the process talking to our friends and colleagues from the Belgrade Association of Bar Blind and Partially Sighted. And our colleague Surgeon made a uh, first model, which you can see on your left-hand side. And we took it to the association for them to check it out. And they said, well, you know, it doesn't really work for us. Like, it's too small and we really don't get the idea. So then we asked Surgeon to make another one which you can see in the center, uh, which was much larger and it was more 3D. And they say, well, now you are on the right track, but it still doesn't make any sense for us. And then we started our downward spiral thinking like, okay, we need to change something. We need to simplify it. We need to do something in order to make it more accessible. <laughs> but at the same time, if we simplify it, it will destroy the original artwork. So then, you know, it's not really the same thing. 
And our friend Nicola, who is actually the president of the association, told us, but you don't need to do anything. Just reproduce it exactly as it is, and then do the proper braille description of what you are presenting. And we were like, ah, right, yeah. This is how it works. <laughs> it was mm. so simple, but mm. you know, you start overthinking and then things don't really function the, the way they should. And uh, then the second part uh, of our learning curve was actually working with the firm that was producing our 3D models. So then we have to figure out like this part with the model, we needed to use uh, color jet 3D printing, which is one particular technology. And that was the easiest because it shows the, the brightest colors. But when we wanted to do a plate with Braille, uh, they told us it needs to be done in stereo lithography because this technology is the most precise so that it can reproduce the Braille letters in the best possible way so it could really have the purpose, you know, that people who actually touch it understand it. And then we used the third uh, technology as well, which is... Uh, fused deposition modeling, which is the simplest one. And this is actually just like melted plastic, which we used for the models I'm gonna show you at the end of presentation. So what happened uh, when we posted our first two models on the walls by the murals, media just went nuts about it. And we were really pleasantly surprised and that Kind of, we never really expected it to happen, but Nicola and I spent almost a month in front of the murals talking about it and talking about the project and about the needs and projects that uh, people at the association have. And Nicola told us that this was maybe the first time since he can remember and since he was the president of the association that they get so much media coverage and it's not related to the international days for the blind and partially sighted. And then we thought, right, like if this is actually what you need, this is what we're gonna get you. Because partially we're gonna get you the project that we planned already with 3D models, but if this other thing we can afford to you and we can give to you uh, without really making too much effort, then this is what we're gonna give you as well. So we made another set of models and uh, these are the murals that we reproduced, but we actually thought in different terms now, like if we need media attention, we're gonna choose the murals that are the most colorful and the murals that were done by the most uh, known and the best loved artists in Belgrade so that we can get some coverage that way as well. And we managed to reproduce five other models that again uh, made this media hype that we never expected and it happened again. So we were very happy that now we can actually work on two fronts. We can make street art accessible, but we also give uh, media time to people who really need to, to talk about their issues and what their real needs are in, in a Serbian society, which is not always the case that they get a possibility to say something like this. And because we are very aware that Belgrade is not a city uh, where a blind person can just uh, walk unassisted, we decided to make extra models, uh, the models I told you, this th third technology that we used, which are actually at the office of the association. And when every person goes there, they can see it, they can touch it, they can talk about it. There is a description in Braille and they can understand that when they go out of the office, there is something on the walls, not only, you know, just like the, the, the mess and, and the chaos of the streets. And as I said, and this is my last slide, uh, we are super happy that finally we got an opportunity to do another idea that we had and to, to produce the mural that already has included elements, 3D elements uh, that are aimed at partially sighted people and blind people and our good friend and colleague Jana will take it from here because this is her uh, artwork and um, her project as well. But yes, first, let's give uh, Liliana a warm, warm applause. And
Jana, before you start, I'd like to take the moment and also recognize that the Belgrade Association for the Blind are in the room, and I would maybe ask them to, to stand up so everyone can see and know who they are. Please stand up. So, if, if you have questions and you want to know how this came together from the people which were there on the ground making this happen, please reach out to them approach them after the session and ask them any questions you may have. Um, thank you, Jana, for your patience. Without further ado, everyone, Jana Danilovic, our graffiti artist, one could say in residence for the Zero Project Conference 2023. Please, the stage is yours. And if we could pull up the PowerPoint again um, from Liliana, thank you very much. So I will be figuring out technology as we go along. Um, PowerPoint if you need it. Uh, okay, so my experience of this project was uh, thrilling on so many levels. Uh, it all began from, you know, as all good things start, call from a friend. So uh, people from uh, Street Art Belgrade Association, who are my friends as well, called me and said, look, we've got an idea. Uh, there was a small mural a friend of mine and I painted on an occasion, and we would like you to uh, we would like to ask for your cons consent to create a 3D model uh, for blind people to actually be able to experience street art and whether I'm okay with it. I think the question was totally misplaced. Of course I was okay with it. And I was thrilled that whole new field opened up for me at that moment because uh, what, I was, what I found the most attractive about street art, because I come from very... Uh, traditional classical uh, art training was the fact that it was essentially democratic and essentially inclusive in its core. But once uh, they came up with the idea, uh, the world as I knew it kind of crumbled because I was completely unaware that it was not as inclusive as I championed it to be. So uh, the whole project was very important for me as a person who actually invests herself a lot into the idea of uh, my art and art on, in public space is so inclusive and so democratic and it does belong to everyone. And I think this project is a huge step in right direction into actually turning public space uh, into inclusive space. So I'm gonna try, oh yes, uh, to, to illustrate it with a couple of slides. Uh, and Myself, as well as the association, uh, have done a lot of projects that are uh, on various levels and in various ways, whether, whether uh, it's uh, in regards to uh, social status, uh, other types of uh, vulnerable groups, vulnerable, I apologize, vulnerable groups are included in our project. Uh, so uh, the idea of actually uh, putting focus on inclusion was not something that was far off from what we were already doing. And even though the whole uh, street art and graffiti community <coughs> might have some bad reputation, some of it well deserved, but uh, bear in mind that people who paint on the street are in a way outsiders and that are very aware of the people who consider themselves outsiders as well. So uh, the whole community of people who paint on the street for various reasons is very sensitive and very inclusive in its nature. So these are a couple of photos from the workshops uh, that are very dear to me and that are just a, a, a kind of a scenography for what I already talked about. And this is the model uh, which actually kick-started our collaboration. Uh, it was a, well, kind of casually painted mural uh, of myself and a, a colleague whose uh, street name is Hope. So uh, when they came to me with the idea of actually creating models, as I, as I previously said, uh, my perspective changed. So uh, I began thinking backwards, you know, uh, when did these barriers come up? Because when you say it, when the idea is already out, you know, we're gonna make reliefs and 3D models. You think about it, well, reliefs have been here throughout whole art history. How come we never use them uh, the way uh, we are using them now the, the, as a means of inclusion? And then I thought about when did these barriers come up? When did we uh, stop thinking or why, never, why haven't we started thinking about people uh, who can use it uh, 
to actually experience art. And what I came up with was uh, basically what we have learned uh, in very uh, traditional terms that visual art is to be perceived through visual apparatus and not to be touched and not to be uh, interfered with. Uh, while all the while we had the sources on resources to actually make it approachable for everyone. So when you see a 3D model, it seems so logical because it was there all along. Uh, and uh, I think all good solutions and all big things come out from the plain sight, actually. And I think it's th the good thing and important thing is that it has been actually put in a spotlight and it has a new and very important purpose now. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the painting that you, uh, which creation you have been witnessing probably for past couple of days. It's called Inclusion. And uh, when I was assigned the task to actually create the design for this uh, conference, uh, it was kind of hard, you know, because I paint daily and painting is not an issue, but uh, having to, to illustrate such a sensitive topic uh, kind of uh, invited me to do a little bit of research. And uh, I went to the people who are my dear friends in my surroundings who live with some sort of disability. So what I told them was, okay, I'm supposed to illustrate inclusion. So it would be super easy to actually illustrate what our differences and barriers are. Let's see what is one thing, many things. What are the things that we share and that are universal? And uh, five out of seven people I talk to, which are all my friends, they know what I do. They, it's very easy to actually come to terms with and to, understa to understanding with people who know who you are and what you do. Uh, anyway, five of those seven people said the hug and the touch were the universal value that we share. So from that point on, it was super easy to actually uh, paint, to come up with a visual solution, the, the design, for, for the painting that's being created here, as the hug is actually something that we all share as a universal sign of support, solidarity, care. So uh, I'm beyond uh, honored to be here to actually be the first person to paint in this building. Never thought something like that would uh, would happen. And uh, as a little bit, little step forward in this project of ours is that we will be including uh, actual 3D pieces into the painting itself. So uh, besides the model that is on display as well, uh, we will be including uh, these models of birds that can actually be touched. And I really encourage everyone to touch the painting as much as they want, because that is the part that I really like about street art and art on the street and murals and general, generally public art is it can be touched, it should be touched, because you touch what you find dear, which you f consider to be yours, and art should be for everyone, and unless it's for everyone, it's no good. So this is what I would conclude with, uh, with also thanking you for having me, for having us, it's been a pleasure. Yana, though, is quite humble in that, uh, let's show what you actually have created live picture taken some 20 minutes ago before we walked into this room of Jana's artwork, which is standing now in the United Nations office at Vienna. Could we pull up that photo? There it is. So you can see it's in the making. Almost finished, Jana, right? Almost there. Almost there. And would you like to then show also the inclusive aspect? And if we get the camera to pan over to... If it's okay, I would just like to explain the process a bit and how specific it was this time uh, in order to actually come to the, the, the permission for the particular design. Uh, the original design was digitally painted and as we had to come to Vienna and have pre-made the model, uh, the painting itself is actually being painted after the model. So the order of steps has been inverted. So it's been challenging in a way, but uh, in other sense, it shows how uh, inter intermingled and how uh, genuinely connected all of these uh, methods of actually creating art are. So I would conclude here. Fantastic. And I'd like to uh, follow the, the pattern of pointing out people who should stand up. If you say, hey, I want this in my city, how do you do this? What's the magic? 
Jelena Popovic and then Alexander Dordovic. Could you please stand up? Uh, stand up. This is, this is the street art Belgrade front and back end team. They ones, they're the ones that make the magic happen. So also please do approach them um, and find out more about their work, how it's progressing. And it's not though all about Belgrade and all about Serbia. We do have other fantastic artists with us today to show that this is one of many approaches. This is not the approach, the golden benchmark. This is a good practice which we are seeking to replicate, but there are also other practices and talking about embedding objects onto walls. I won't give too much away, and therefore I'd like to uh, welcome our distinguished uh, guest, Jill Wells, who is a fellow at the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement, a dear partner of the Zero Project. And Jill, we're very thankful that you are with us here tonight. Well, tonight, not yet. Today, <laughs> early afternoon. Um, Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, if I can have PowerPoint, please. Hello everyone, my name is Jill Wells. I'm a 42-year-old black indigenous person of color. I have short black hair, I'm wearing a black shirt and black slacks. I'm a US-based artist, advocate, and mentor. I hold a Bachelor in Fine Arts degree from Drake University, and I'm a Harkin Institute Fellow. My pronouns are she, her. It is a pleasure and tremendous honor to be in conversation with you all today, sharing time and space, whether virtually or in person. In my PowerPoint sharing, you'll come to know some of my journey, both indoors and outdoors, collaborations and future endeavors within my art and advocacy work. In this slide, I am in an immersive art space that is of blue and braille. Within my public and private practice, art allows me to investigate accessibility, history, stereotypes, race, gender, systems of oppression, and human experiences. Through the use of various mediums, interdisciplinary social engagement art workshops, community engagement projects, and talks, I work with individuals of all abilities to create new modes of working through the arts. From 2012 to 2020, I was a alcohol and substance use counselor for the state of Iowa. In 2020, I founded Artist X Advocacy Mentorship Program, or AXA, an annual paid youth and young adult mentorship program with initial funding from an Iowa Arts and Resilience Grant. The focus of AXA is to bring awareness to art as a career option, especially for individuals living with disabilities. This year, AXA is curating the Freedom of Expression Project, which is a 13 artist project and exhibition that promotes the participation of individuals living with disabilities in and through the arts. Freedom of Expression underscores the relationship between human experiences and the right of freedom of expression and opinion as essential to the ability of persons of all abilities to develop as individuals and to participate fully in all aspects of life on an equal basis. Within my art career of 20 plus years, 15 of those years were spent focusing on visual arts only. Despite my best efforts to make and create inclusive art, it was not until 2020 that I started to integrate the power of touch through the use of Braille into my artwork and observed and asked individuals who were in observation to please do touch the artwork. Mm. To a broader and more inclusive sensory perception is what I was working towards. I created the Feel series in partnership with the Iowa Department for the Blind, which is a multimedia series of works on the Braille pages of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. This series focuses on making art more accessible through history, tactile elements, sound, light, and color. In this slide, there's an individual interacting with these artworks. As a Mandela Washington Fellowship coach in 2022, I was able to work with a group of 25 Mandela Fellows from all over Africa. This individual in this image is one of those fellows. In this slide, there are five multicolored Braille LED light boxes in a dark sensory room. Around the same time, I began researching light boxes, sensory art spaces, and sensory dark rooms. 
Both light boxes and dark sensory rooms can be extremely useful for individuals living with visual impairments, as well as time spent in a sensory room improves visual, auditory, and tactile processing and provides a sense of calm and comfort to self-regulate and improve focus. I started the Blackboard Sensory Art Project to provide for the development side of this research and began a local, local and global discourse around four questions. What is art to you? What is accessibility to you? What makes art inaccessible for you? And what role does art play in your life? From these answers, I began creating touch-activated sound art that combines both the Feel series and the Blackboard series. Touch-activated sound art seeks to change fundamental aspects of a visitor's interaction with art. These multimedia sound works incorporate different textures, braille, visual composition, and musical composition. When you touch different parts of the artwork, different sounds or audio descriptions are activated. In this photo, A mother and son are inside an art gallery interacting with a piece of touch-activated sound art. The male is wearing headphones and touching the art to activate instrumental sounds. The male is my brother and the female is my mother. Mm. In 1998, my brother suffered from an intravenous malformation or an AVM rupture in the base of his brain during his sleep. An AVM is an abnormal tangle of blood vessels connecting arteries and veins that disrupts the normal blood flow. For my brother, this rupture caused massive brain bleeding in his brain, a heart attack, and permanent brain damage. It also was the cause of the loss of his eyesight. My brother is a tremendous driving force behind my work. In this slide, I'm with Senator Tom Harkin while he interacts with my touch-activated sound art. We are inside a building in Ireland. In order to experience the public accessibility of the Blackboard Series art project, I debuted these works on a global stage in 2022 at the Hargan Summit in Belfast, Ireland. Because the long-term goal of Blackboard is to look into a new future of public art that will incorporate universal multi-sensory design so that anyone, regardless of ability, can experience the artwork. That means art that is movable for different statures and abilities, tactile murals accessible via touch and sound, early education, sensory art spaces, and public and private inclusive art spaces. In this slide, there are two separate images of myself on outdoor lifts, uh, creating public works of um, art in Iowa. So how would this type of public art be accomplished? For Iowa, and the Iowa community, the first iteration of such a mural and space will begin this March when I begin installation for creating one of these pieces at the Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School in Des Moines, Iowa. In my experience of creating public art, the logistics and the narrative of the works are the keys to accomplishing inclusion. Who are the people that are involved? And what types of equipment, spaces, supplies are accessible or being designed for the execution of the work. I believe everyone here on panel has been asking these questions and creating solutions. And this slide is a photo of an outdoor street mural with braille and English text, both spelling love. There is a portrait of a black female on the left of the braille text there is a colorful rainbow palette for the mural. In closing today, I would like to share a simple yet important piece of public art with you, co-created by myself, Dublin street artist Chelsea Jacobs, and a host of diverse community members in the Havelocks of Dublin, Ireland. This mural entitled Dublin Love did not have all the answers to the logistics because the focus was on the narrative. I believe that in order for works of art to be truly inclusive, the images and the narrative must reflect the truth of our world. This means showing diversity in terms of age, gender, race, ethnicity, culture, languages, text, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, 
body size, employment, and other factors. Representation of marginalized cultures and populations are within themselves acts of resistance against systems of oppression. My hope was that the representation of the disability and LGBTQ plus community within this mural out on the streets, standing up for love, would help change the narrative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. And I think the next speaker will try to tie all of this together and how it comes into the public space and how we can scale the good practices we've heard here. Our next speaker is Jakob Katner, the artistic director for Carla Libre. And those of you who do not know Carla Libre, it's one of the largest European street art festivals, which uh, takes place once a year here in Vienna, Austria. And Jakob will tell us a bit more about that and his assessment on where the street art, let's call it industry, stands. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks so much to Zero Conference, to Mr. Essel, to Robin for bringing this important topic to a really big platform and to all of you like bringing this um, yeah, new approach to street art to life. So I think it's amazing. So yeah, my name is Jacob. Um, I'm a half Sri Lankan, half Austrian creative director, artistic director. Um, I did my master's in fine arts and cultural theory and the PhD in urban art. I'm wearing a UNHCR athletics, uh, self-made, where the, it's stitched so you can basically touch me if you want, so you can feel the, see? That's why I wore it today. So um, today I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about our approach um, me growing up in Upper Austria, which is basically a little bit racistic state in Austria, I always felt like left out. So basically I felt like my skin color is a disability because I was never part of the Austrians. So um, yeah, so I began rapping and this was my connects with the hip hop culture and therefore the graffiti culture. And um, that's where my interest uh, started to immerse myself in street art. Because I think street art is such a democratic art form, uh, really inclusive and really accessible for everyone to see. Maybe I could have my PDF, I don't know if there's, can show something. So yeah, um, I always thought that, so that was a misconception because this was a complete black spot and basically you guys brought it to life. I was never aware that our street art is not accessible for blind people. There was. Like, it was like, wow, I was like gazing at uh, this black, blank spot because, you know, when I think about street art, it's the most democratic art form where no matter what kind of social status, age, race, ethnicity, you always have a connect with this art form and it's for everyone to see. But um, as um, I now know, it's not for everyone to see. So I'm super happy that we now can include braille and tactile versions to our uh, art form. Still no PDF, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit of, uh, about our street art festival, the Calle Libre. It basically means free street, and it brings together artists from all over the world here to Austria, and we have a really transdisciplinary approach, so we don't wanna just paint walls and show them. Uh, we're also having workshops, so workshops is something where you can really go out and touch the can, you can smell the can, the fumes, you can hear the cans, and yeah, you basically speak to the artist, and uh, this is something I think where really all the senses are included. So um, yeah, if you have time and if you're here, I'm really happy to welcome you to one of our workshops. Uh, at the festival, and also like the, the street artists, uh, they always kind of feel always like a little outsider. So we want to bring them into light, give them a stage, and like you know, give the people the opportunity to talk to them. Because like normally street art and graffiti, it's made in the dark. You imagine it's some guy with a hoodie on, probably a criminal. But most of the time, it's not. Um, most of the time it's just a guy that wants, or a woman that wants to express her feelings and bring it to the public space. 
So I think a lot of people um, are excluded from art because some people can't afford the entry to museums. And uh, so for me, I think street art is basically an art form with, with a disability because it's excluded from the, from the art uh, historian and uh, high art institutions, like, you know, street and graffiti always is uh, seen as vandalism, and yeah, they're like the, the youngsters. And I think now talking about this here in the United Nations is such a pleasure, and I see we gain recognition, we gain reputation, and um, as we are having those three tactile versions of our street art pieces now in Vienna, it's a first mover thing, it's bringing a whole new level to it, and I would wish um, that we can do more of that, and that people could go and touch it. It's actually the first time I see it and can touch it. So, I would hope, uh, we're asking you, uh, maybe let's do more of this, and as uh, Jelena already painted here the first time in the UN, uh, we are actually planning to paint the first time on the UN, so on one of those walls this August, and I would be very happy to include some of that three-dimensional tactile art form. Yeah, I think uh, basically that's it. Let's uh, make the street art more accessible, and thanks for the invitation. Without further ado, I'd like to open up to questions in the audience, because I've been looking around, I've, uh, reading facial expressions. I would like to argue there's quite some interest, and there are quite a lot of people in the room, so do raise your hand, click on the big square, and ask the questions to our panel. Please not to me, I'm not interesting. Our speakers are, ask them about the project, so do raise your hand if you have a question. Hello, I'm Simon, hello. Um, I was curious to know, I'd love to see, I come from Melbourne, which is a big street art scene. What were some of the challenges, or when maybe they were very excited, for the cities, the organizers of cities, to be a part of this project? What did you notice was difficult to convince them, or maybe it was easy? I think this is the question for Lilia. Okay, so uh, what we did, we took actually graffiti and street art strategy and we just went and did it. We didn't ask anyone. The reason for that are multiple. Uh, mainly, uh, Belgrade is not a place where it's easy to be a blind person because uh, people in our streets don't park the cars properly. They don't pick up the poop after their dogs. They... Uh, like city firms dig up the craters in the middle of the street that they don't uh, market properly. So like anybody can break their necks. And then we realized that uh, we don't really need to talk to, uh, to the city institutions. We actually need to talk to people on the streets because they are one responsible for all of these things. And they need to know that they have neighbors and friends who are blind and who need to uh, have the proper space in order to navigate that space independently. So this is why we completely uh, kind of went around the, the public institutions. Uh, they have nothing to do with us. Uh, they don't uh, really contact us. We don't communicate with them. This is a project we did with the Association of Blind and Partially Sighted, and they are the only partners we have. Generally, I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I can't tell you more because we don't collaborate with cities. Simon Technically, speaking, it tells if, me to just ditch the city. If they were a band, they would have been a punk band, you know, because no <laughs> rules apply to them. <laughs> I would there is one point, Liliana, you might want to elaborate on. You did have some quite interesting outreach to, I think, a demographic we don't usually associate with the street art scene, which are the elderly. Ah, yes, seniors. Well, this was also an uh, underground thing. So uh, we worked with seniors. 
uh, for many years now. Uh, we usually have either spring or autumn uh, workshops for seniors. Uh, our motto is we're making vandals 65 plus. And this, this is amazing thing, you know. Um, we are really, really proud to say that uh, all of these seniors that have participated in our workshops, every time we call different artists so they can learn different approaches, different techniques. Jana actually did one of them, but then we did stencil workshop, we did graffiti workshop, we did street art workshop. Like, you can try everything with different approaches because every artist has their own approach. And uh, this was amazing, and I really have to tell you one tiny thing. It's like after the workshop, one of the elderly ladies who was working with one of our graffiti writers who was like, you really wouldn't approach him on the streets. But she told him like, okay, son, now you know where I live. And when you are working in the neighborhood, working meaning producing art without permission in the streets in my neighborhood, just pop in at, uh, for a juice. You know? So this is just, you know, you know, putting people together and, you know, the world is your oyster. Everything is possible. Fantastic. Um, please, Cleo. Um, okay, so I have two questions. I'm Cleo Bria from Israel, and I am actually an art student right now in the University of Haifa. Um, so I have a question for you um, about accessibility and other, I mean, I agree that street art is the most uh, accessible art that there is, and it's art for everyone, like was said here, but I actually recently joined in on a project for psychosocial disabilities um, with art students and I actually thought about it and our mural is completely inaccessible for wheelchair users um, because of many, many flights of stairs that needed to, to get to there. So if you have any ideas on how to make it even more accessible, maybe a gallery that's accessible for everyone that shows off these um, uh, tablets, I don't know how to call them. Art forms, well, uh, we've been thinking about that a lot because our first virtual reality exhibition, which you can find on our site, it's available to everyone, uh, came to be exactly for that reason. Because we thought, okay, street art is the most accessible art Th there is, but not everybody can approach it. Like, if you're an elderly per person and need assistance moving, you probably won't go, you know, into, like, old dingy corners and, you know, pissed streets and, you know, underground passages in order to see graffiti and street art. And if you're in a wheelchair, as you pointed out, you probably won't be able to. And then we thought, yes, we should do virtual reality exhibition, but in a way that it's not 360. Uh, we actually had a uh, space made for us in which you can move. You move in virtual reality. You pass by the street, pass by the walls, pass by the exhibition um, selection that we have, and in virtual reality, you are free to walk. So this was our answer. We couldn't really find any other way because from our point of view, street art and graffiti should be in the streets. You should not really put them in the in the gallery because then it's not street art and graffiti, then it's like art, artistic interpretation of what graffiti and street art is. It doesn't mean it's bad, it just means that it's not graffiti and street art. So um, the only way we find out how to make it more accessible for wheelchair users or elderly people was exactly that in virtual reality. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would also say that looking at indoor spaces as well for sensory spaces, whether those are integrated into uh, senior facilities, into schools, um, into your home, into the UN, where if you're needing a safe space where you can still have all your senses um, engaged with different textures, pillows, you can even do braille wallpaper. Um, sound with music, headphones, so you could integrate um, virtual reality within those spaces as well. So it's a very all-encompassing, inclusive space um, that would provide for that psychosocial uh, need um, in managing mental health and a, another, multiple other components. 
So if you're looking for like a gallery offshoot type of space, you could think of it as such, where it's still a, a sensory space. It's just a non-traditional gallery. So you could have visual works of art, tactile works of art. Um, yeah, the, the VR. Thank you. So you're saying as many sensory options as possible, the better. I'm a firm advocate for that, absolutely, because everyone in this room is so individual. We're all going to probably, from one time or another, need different types of sensory engagements for our perception and for self-regulation with psychosocial. So it's just, I feel like inclusion is, is the more, sometimes the better, as options go. Thank you so much. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was inclusive art, inclusive street art specifically. A big round of applause, please, to all organization and speakers in the room. And I like to think this was the best advertisement for our online audience to join us in person next year at the Zero Project Conference 2024, where I would like to bet some money there will be another inclusive art installation. Let's make it happen. See you there. Thank you very much. Day three, Zero Project Conference. Have a great weekend.